Not all things need to have a reason. Art, for example, doesn't have a reason. It just, it just is. I'm not saying I'm making art. But I'm saying there are things that do not require a practical, you know, wrench reason. I absolutely love speaking with other creative people that think deeply about the work that they do and seek to push the limits of what's possible. A major reason for why this podcast even came to be is this desire to dig deeper into that, to understand the motives and the rationale behind why people do what they do. And that is why I am super pleased to share with you a conversation I immensely enjoyed with Alex, formerly known as French Guy Cooking. He has built an audience of millions sharing his love of cooking and his eternal experiments in the kitchen. I have for a long time now been very intrigued by his contagious sense of curiosity and the lengths to which he will go to find answers to the questions that he has. He'll go way in depth on things that many of us take for granted. You know, he'll do these multi-part series on specific dishes or even specific ingredients. And I mention that because that's something that we reference frequently in this conversation. All right, before we dive into the conversation itself, I wanna briefly thank the sponsor of this episode, which is Lingoda. You can check them out in the description as a great way to support this podcast. Lingoda offers 60 minute classes for learning foreign languages that are live and online with experienced teachers that provide feedback, which is extremely important when you're learning a foreign language. They have a seven day free trial during which you can take three group classes or one private class. So you can see for yourself if you like it. The way it works, in those lessons, you and three to four students will focus on real life conversation, practicing speaking, as well as grammar structure. You can either book your classes online following their structured curriculum or select by topic for full flexibility. It's flexible, available 24 seven, and you have the freedom to filter classes based on your preferred times to suit your own schedule. Lingoda offers a bunch of great resources for student learning, such as warm up and review exercises, flashcards, and annotated PDFs from all of the teachers. They also have a placement test to figure out what level of courses you should be taking in case you're feeling lost. And their curriculum follows the CEFR, which is an international standard. I'll leave a link to that placement test in the description if you'd like to figure out your own current ability in the language you're interested in getting better at. And the more monthly classes that you commit to, the more you can save. I find it particularly helpful to have a safe learning environment like this to practice speaking and not feel so bad about making silly mistakes versus in the real world where the stakes feel so much higher. I think that kind of fear of making mistakes can really block you in from progressing. Now, I've already mentioned the free trial, but if you're interested in signing up with Lingoda for the longer term, you can use my code NOBACKUP25 and get 25% off the first two months of your subscription. I will leave a link to that down below in the description if you wanna check it out. Thank you, Lingoda, for your support of this podcast. And now, let's dive into the conversation. Yeah, I'm so excited about this. Um, I, uh, I'm a big fan of your videos and the way that you approach what you do. Thank you. If you don't mind, like, I'll just dive into the deep end a little bit here. Go for it. I'll just start with an observation. I was a huge fan, I am a huge fan of uh, Chef's Table, a lot of these shows about like the best cooks in the world. Um, and I've noticed that there just seems to be this like obsessiveness in a lot of the people that are the best at what they do. It's just something that really intrigues me because there, there's like a positive side to that and a negative side to that. And I sense that a little bit in kind of how you approach what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, like your pasta series had 17 parts, right? Yes. So do you feel that that is a necessary trait that you have to have to make it in, mm. you know, the, the world of, I guess, both YouTube content creation, but also like cooking and, and food in general? I think being slightly or sometimes a little too much obsessive mm -hmm. is more of a trait that I've got in general. And I'm not trying to fight it in my videos. I feel like it's bringing something to the story mm -hmm. because it's pushing me forward. Me, it's, it's forcing me to try and improve to reconsider, to accept failures, to, uh, to, to strive, to, to try and, and, and be better. And I feel like this is like almost like the, um, the backbone of what I do. I try to be better on my channel. People don't know that I'm try, trying to be better also as an individual mm -hmm. on a personal level. But like on, on, on the cooking channel, I think it's pretty visual. Mm. The character 
He's trying to, to, to get better. And he's doing this by being persistent or obsessive, I think. So you take food, you take everything that you do, it sounds like, yeah. as this opportunity for growth as a person. Mm -hmm. Is it like how you overcome the failures that you encounter when you're on your experiments or... You know, or is it just like, is it broader than that even? I, th I think it, it might be broader than this, but like on, on the channel, at least, this is how I overcome the failures. Yeah, uh, absolutely. This is just by being persistent, accepting failure. This is something I've been, I've been shifting to over the years. Mm. The channel didn't start like this. It started in a more classic way. I was doing recipes. I was doing more straightforward videos, which were from, I think, from a, from a cinema point of view, from a narrative point of view. A recipe is pretty terrible in the sense that you know what you're going to get and you get it. So there's no story. And then at some point I realized this is, this is slightly too far from the reality of things that I do in my studio, in the workshop or in the kitchen, because I have plenty of fails. And also this is boring as a, as a video to watch, as a film to watch. So how do I get closer to something that is um, more sincere? Yeah. And also closer to who I am. How do I embrace the failures? How do I show the audience? How do I inspire them to overcome failure, to embrace them, to accept, and then not to stall, to just keep on moving forward bit by bit? And I, and, and I made it possible, I think, in my videos by, by embracing this obsession for perfection or I'm trying to get perfect because it never gets perfect in my videos. That's yeah. like the, the, the pasta series. It ended on, on a failure, on semi failure, but still a failure. <laughs> well, um, okay. That's an interesting direction to go, but exploring the idea of failure, I want to get there, but I ask you this, this, this question about obsessiveness, uh, because I do think it's what makes what you do so fascinating, so interesting to watch. You know, it's not just about the food that you're making, the experiments that you're on. It's like you as a character mm -hmm. are so intriguing to observe. And I also feel that I struggle with this myself because I have some of this as well. And I think Same. what gets dangerous with this, what I'm trying to, what I'm always, what I often find myself thinking about is how to balance this or if balance is even possible because I find it's sort of my superpower, but it's also like this thing that I can get carried away with. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there can be this feeling of exhaustion afterwards because I get mm -hmm. so lost in the pursuit of getting to the bottom of something. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you ever do you deal with yeah, this? Yeah, 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 a lot. A lot. There, there, there's, a, there's a bright and a dark side. To, there's a bright and a dark side to, to this obsessiveness. It's serving a purpose. It's helping moving forward and overcoming failures and, and breaking walls and picking yourself up when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful to be that persistent, that uh, there's a bit of courage in, inside of it also. But, but at the same time, it's almost sometimes like a disease. It's like, ah, there's a detail. I should, I should not look at it, but I can't stop staring at it because I know it's wrong and I can't move forward with that detail being off. And it's just like, I'm trying to move my head away, my, my sight away from it, but I can't. I have to fix this before I move forward. And it's a pain because then you have to fix all the details. And they're, they're like, there's an endless list of details that you need to fix. So it's also a learning curve for me. I've been trying to, to use it when I need it and to let it go when I don't. Have you been able to develop that ability to do that? Because I I've, I've still don't think I have that fully developed. <laughs> Maybe it, I'm getting a little on, better. On a, on a personal level, yes, that's, that's, that's my main, that's the thing I've been working on for a while. I've been trying to just accept things I can't change, you know, and, and change the things I can. So it's, it's but, but like in the videos, yeah, it depends on the subject. Sometimes you need to be obsessive. It's fun to be obsessive. And also it's very entertaining. You said it's yourself. When you watch, when you've been watching some of my videos, you said it's intriguing to watch this guy get, getting obsessed about a detail that is arbitrary. And, and I'm thinking exactly, I'm turning my audience into therapists or into, you know, medical team. And they're just watching me, examining me like, oh. I think it's a pretty serious case, this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it doesn't seem like you have any limit with, uh, you'll go into any direction. 
right? Like you'll get, you'll do. But I don't. I, I think I don't have any limit. I mean, more or less. Right. In, in a re reasonable way, yeah. Like for example, with the pasta series, I would go any length to try and solve the problem I am facing, which was like drying pasta. Right. And I feel like this is also, this is also, this, this is definitely um, an entertainment aspect of my video this is this is for show purposes this is for entertainment purposes but at the same time it's sending a message and it's you it, it, it's it definitely is you. me it is definitely 100 percent me but also I'm, I'm sending a message to the audience i'm saying you see it's possible yeah there it is just requires a bit of persistence it's doable yeah there is something very inspiring about that like it's i think there is something really important in witnessing people really pursue their curiosities mm. and not let setbacks stop them. It does say, you can do this. You know, you can be curious about the world and about life. And when I was younger, I don't know if I, it was, I felt I had as much permission to do that because it can, it can feel weird and scary, mm -hmm. right? Because people will look at you funny. I don't know if you've ever dealt with this where you want to get to the bottom of something and people are like, but why does it matter? You know, all the time. Yeah. How did you? It seems like you're way more comfortable mm -hmm. in your own skin with that. Was that just kind of, uh, you know, something that you developed and learned over time? You just were like, "This is how I am, and this is just how it is." I think so. Yeah, I've, I've been accepting this over the years, and I've been embracing like the, the the traits of my personality. This is a deeper problem that you're you, you're referring to. I feel when people, for example, on my channel, they say. Um, why do you do this? You don't have to do this. You can just go in any grocery store and buy a bag of pasta right. for one, one buck. And you're trying to reinvent the wheel. This is unnecessary. This is like a waste, basically, of time, a waste of effort. This is madness. I think, I think they might be right, or like on, on a practical level, but they are wrong on a deeper level. N not all things need to have a reason. Art, for example, doesn't have a reason. It, it just it just is. I'm not saying I'm making art, but I'm saying there are things that do not require a practical, you know, wrench reason. So I'm doing this because I can. I'm doing this because knowledge is beautiful, because like um, the world is fascinating, because people are like... I like to connect with people in general. I just, I'm just doing this because I can do this. And, I'm in, and I've built, I've, I've made a job that is custom made to my personality. I've built this job exactly for me. So now I'm doing things that I can because I think it matters in the end. I think it does matter. And when people say that, I don't even flinch. I know it matters because I've seen it. I, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years, about 10 years. Sometimes it's easy to forget the impact we can have on people. I, I don't have to be pretentious. I don't have to overstate the impact that I have. But I just chat with people in general and I just see it. Wow. That that amazing answer, honestly. <laughs> I I love that so much. And it's an idea that I find myself grappling with a lot because mm. You know, now I think things have shifted, but a few years ago, it was much more in the like self-improvement uh, productivity space. And the problem is, uh, just like you, I do care about growing as a person and improving. But what I've come to realize is that doesn't always have to be through some sort of like productive means, mm. if that makes sense. Yes, a lot. I feel I like we're here to experiment. I think so. And do things that sometimes you can't even explain mm. and that's okay that's just being human you know i think there's this strong push towards trying to be like a machine yes in the world that the we grind. live in yeah and now we feel we have to compete against like artificial intelligence and all these technological advancements and whatnot it's crazy yeah and i just don't know if i want to this, this is just i mean you're, you're making a, a, a great point i think this is just one way to be moving forward we want to we want to self improve. We want to improve in life. I don't want I don't want to stagnate. I don't want to stay the same. I just want to be better. I want to correct the flaws that I've got, if possible, fix the flaws that I've got, or accept them if I can't fix them. But like striving, fighting, 
uh, grinding. This is one way to move forward, but this is not the only way. Right. Accepting is another one. Resting is another one. Being nice. I don't know. Uh, uh, caring for the personal side of things. Caring for... I was at a dinner party in Sweden a few years ago. And was this for the meatball series? That you yes, did? for the meatball series. Man, it's a, I love that you will go to the ends of the earth for your experiments. It's amazing. Anyway, sorry, keep going. For, for the meatball series. But then we had a dinner with YouTube executive that night. Wow. And there were only older people than I was at the table. And one of the ladies, she was great. She was talking about her daughter striving to be better, being very competitive. And she said, She's doing this because my daughter thinks that this is the definition of a good human being. This is how you are valuable to society, to yourself, to the greater good. This is how you, this is what defines you as a person. And then she said, that's sad. And I said, why? Why is that sad? And she said, because you can be you can be a good person just by being good to others, for example. You don't have to be the best at this and this and that. You can just be a good actor in your community, for example, and then you're a good person as well. The value is not defined by the achievement. And I was like, okay, I'm taking notes on the side <laughs> in my notebook. <laughs> value is not defined by the achievements. Yeah, she was very right. And then I thought, I mean, it, it wasn't like a, a aha moment, but then it was just like st still something that I had at the back of my mind for a while. And I was thinking, Getting better by always doing more is, it works, but it's exhausting. You said it yourself. It's just like it demands so many efforts. And, and, and I feel like a person can only provide so many efforts. So yeah. that's probably why some, so many YouTubers are like sometimes exhausted after some point. Or so many content creators in general can get a little exhausted at some point. Because that way of improving is it's just one. Out of many. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be part of a bigger cycle, I find. I think, yes. Because what's interesting is my creative projects or my, you know, these adventures that I'm on, they in many ways give me energy, but they also require a lot of energy. So it can't be the only thing I do all the time. That's mm -hmm. just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and recognizing, I mean, it's just the classic idea, really, that like too much of anything is even if it's a great thing for you, is not a good thing for you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just so easy to lose sight of that because... You get trapped, yeah. You get trapped. It's it's almost like even just being curious about why we feel we have to go to the ends of the earth to answer particular questions, mm -hmm. that in and of itself can reveal a lot about ourselves, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think your story is fantastic because of the role that you play actually that you're you were only just like a soundboard for that lady i think so yeah yeah and it was almost like she was just thinking out loud figuring she this was. out for herself she was and you're also figuring it out yeah. as you, so that's it's just this interesting um i don't know uh journey that i feel we all have to go on right like you can only figure out what the right balance is by screwing it up yeah right? yeah yeah I feel so, yeah, for sure. It's funny because I was, uh, so as, as you guessed, I was in Sweden for like the meatball series. So I was exactly, you know, try trying to improve myself by doing more. Mm -hmm. I was in that state and she was saying the opposite. She, or not the opposite, but she was, she was evoking another path. Way simpler, way more down to earth. And I was like, hmm. That does make sense. But I'm trying to incorporate some of that in my, in my work now. I've been, you know, I've been evolving. It's, it's funny when you, when you consider like um, any content creator or any creator that has been doing something for like a number of years, in my case, almost 10. The work that I do and the work that I've done have, has evolved a lot over the years. The length, the scripts, the narrative, the importance of the characters, the goal that I'm aiming at. Everything has changed so many times, even the topic. I mean, food in general, but food is so vast. Yeah. And I've, I've been making series about stitching a grocery bag together. So, and I've been doing series about meatballs. There's there's wide array of topics in between, like a grocery bag and why 
usually grocery bag sucks, I think. And, 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 and then how to perfect the Swedish meatball. So I feel like I've been, you know, shooting episodes in different directions over the years until I found something that r resonated with me. Mm. And I feel it wasn't bound to the topic, in fact. It was bound to the approach itself. Mm -hmm. It was more about the way I explore things. The series are... It's, it's weird to say this, but the subject doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's what what we have to say about it, what we have to discover about it. I can make a series. I mean, the subject does matter a bit, obviously, but it matters less than, than what I thought. The context is always important. If, if like nobody cares about the subject, it's going to be harder to make a series about it. But it might be also funnier or it might be maybe a little more interesting or like less expected maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do take into account like the, 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 the not the trends, but the, the context and the appeal of this or that subject for the audience. But, but ultimately, I feel like what makes the series that I work on interesting or not is how I tackle them what we are going to find, not, not what we're going to find, but more like, how are we finding things? Mm -hmm. What's the journey? Who do we meet along the way? What do we do with our discovers? This is more like, this is the backbone. This is the thing that has been, that I have been refining over the years. And this is where I'm heading at in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, do you find it's dangerous at all? Because I'm not saying you always do this, but oftentimes you are kind of working towards some idea of or some semblance of perfection, right? Mm. Uh, fully knowing, I suspect, that you can never get there. But Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And it's, part of, it's, maybe? Part, it's part of the fun as well yeah. to embrace the fact that ah, I wish I could. Yeah. But do you feel it's dangerous at all? Do you ever get lost in really trying to make something actually perfect? I never believe it. Okay. I never believe. I, I know... It's just a fun game for you. It's just a fun game. Exactly. And also, it, you know, it's, it's a basic saying. I heard this as a kid. You, if you don't aim at the moon, you don't end up in the stars, right? You have to aim at something hard and aim at something with higher standards. Otherwise, if I aim at something super low, I'm going to achieve that. Mm -hmm. But where's the progress? Where's the fun in all this? And also, it only works... And I think I think it's it's very right what you just said. It only works because I'm aware that I will never get there, and it doesn't matter. I'm not aiming at perfection to reach it. I'm aiming at perfection to to give me a direction, mm. and I'm okay with a, like ending, you know, closer, further, whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Wow. Um. Okay, on this topic of obsessiveness, because there's so much to explore here, um, I, I've also noticed the importance that both you and all these top chefs that I've watched on different series place on ingredients, like an obsession, you know, only the best possible ingredient. And I see so often in your series, you're, you're narrowing down to something ultra specific, right? Like how you're going to make the pasta mm -hmm. or, you know, the more recent, like the paella, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think, why are the ingredients so important? Why is that such a massive piece of this? That's a very good question, I think. There are cuisines, I think, that would illustrate this better than French cuisine. Italian cuisine, for example, or Spanish cuisine. You mentioned paella just a moment ago. Spanish cuisine, like paella, I feel like it relies more on the ingredients than the technique, almost. It's funny because like people, people are very often scared of cooking in general. This is something I've discovered over the years. I wasn't particularly afraid of cooking, but I didn't know people were terrified by it. And also, just for the record, what you do is crazy, man. You're, you're taking on another cuisine from another culture, if you screw that up, yes, th that is crazy. Yes. You know, I see yeah. people in the comments talking about how you could start a, a war in Europe if you do, you know, yeah. something incorrectly, right, with Italian cuisine yes. or Spanish cuisine. So, I mean, that is how are you not afraid? I'm never afraid of this because I'm 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 
passionate about learning other people's other people's culture. So I know I I don't know that I'm going to do a perfect job at this or that, but I know that at least I'm going to pay justice to the dish because I've been doing my research. I'm a very scholar boy. So I've, I'm I'm going to be studying, I'm going to be going beyond the expected. And I'm going to be double checking everything. And then I'm going to deliver something I believe in. And then I, I'm thinking, no, I'm not going to offend anybody. Because people are going to, people might say, and they might be right, that I'm wrong in this or that aspect. But at least they won't be able not to acknowledge the fact that I did my part. I did my best to try and understand that culture. I paid justice to it. So I'm, I'm never scared about tackling, for example, a Roman dish. Rome, Rome, a Roman dish in Italy. That's that's probably one of the scariest dishes you could tackle. If you mess up carbonara, if you mess up cacio e pepe, if you mess up amatriciana, you're dead. You're dead. This is the end of your world. Because the comment section is going to be ruined. <laughs> but then I know that I'm 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 doing a, a genuine genuine approach to all yeah. this. So, and and I'm putting the work and I'm putting the hours as well. Yeah. And I think people can feel that. So, sorry, I lost the train of thought. Well, the so, initial, yeah, yeah. yeah so, we're, yeah, we're the on the importance a of the ingredients. Tangent, yeah. So, and and for example, if 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 you consider Spanish cuisine, if you consider Italian cuisine, both super. Uh, I mean, these uh, Spanish cuisine and Italian cuisine are like beautiful example of why ingredients matters. Very simple cu cuisines. Most, I mean, Italian cuisine is notorious for being simple, for being very demanding, very complicated. But when you look at the recipes, there is nothing compared to a French recipe in general. I'm, 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 I'm you know, uh, um, I'm rounding things a bit, but yeah. like a French recipe is probably twice as long as an Italian recipe in general. Because they, they know that you start with prime ingredients first and the flavors are already there. You don't have to do much. The only work you have to do if you work with prime ingredients, you have not to mess them up. That's your only job in the recipe. Try not to touch them too much, not to bruise them too much, not to cook them too much. Try to make them shine, end of the recipe. And the recipe is amazing because of you, a mm, little bit, but mostly because of the ingredients. In French recipes, at least French traditional recipes, because I feel like there has been a massive change over the years the recipe or the outcome the dish is amazing because of all the process mm -hmm. because of like the tedious amount of work you've put into that recipe the technique the the everything and it's like neglecting the importance of the ingredients even though i mean in french cuisine ingredients are like crucial as well but i feel like you feel them a bit less down the line i i'd say in in, in the end i'd say that the quality of ingredient matters very much because it makes your work, your job way easier in general. Start with a great piece of steak. Start with a great tomato. You don't have to do much. Your, your, your work, your job in the kitchen is going to be way easier. Yeah, that's a great analogy for life, right? Mm. If you are able to start with very high quality ingredients, everything else that comes afterwards is is it better? It's just better. I think right? so, yeah. I mean, this is, I wanted to ask you about this because maybe you take it for granted. Have you spent time in the United States? Yes. Okay, so I'm not saying there isn't good food there, but one of the biggest culture shocks, uh, and culture shock is usually a negative term, but I'm using it actually in a positive way, is when I came from the United States to Europe was the quantum leap in the quality of base ingredients, just in general, there's a, just a, a, a huge increase in the quality of what you get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that this probably has a lot to do with regulations. This has a lot to do with a lot of things, but it's also cultural. It's like, I, I get the sense that people here will not tolerate really poor quality stuff. Um, mm. And I'm generalizing. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's not possible to find bad quality stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just something that really struck me because it's like when you have that higher level starting point, as you pointed out, it's just everything is better after that. Mm -hmm. And when you have a low quality starting point, yes. it's very difficult to make something amazing out of that. And so it, it, it's, all, it's very difficult. I mean, in terms of technique, 
but it's also wrong in many aspects. Why would you start from something of a lower quality? Like lower quality, what does it mean? It, does it mean less flavorful? Or does it have like deeper implications? Like, has it been badly grown? Did they use pesticides? Are they paying the workers properly? There's a social, cultural aspect. Uh, where, where does it come from? Is it local? Is it not local? Uh, is it the season? Is it not the season? So bad ingredient could, could mean so many different things. I can make, I won't do it, but I can make a very tasty dish with bad ingredients. You think you can? You think it's possible? 100% I can. Okay. I can make butter chicken, for example, mm -hmm. with bad chicken. It's going to taste good, but I won't do it because it's, it's, it's bad. So it's, 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 it's a complicated problem, but I, I definitely felt it in the US, what you, what you just said. Like the connection with food is... And also, I'm not American, so it's very hard for me to just try and do deductions mm -hmm. from, from, from a foreigner's point of view. But I can only sense that in grocery stores, food is presented in a different way. Right. And that the distance between uh, the food and I, or the food and, and the people, is greater. It's almost like there's a bit of more plastic. There's a bit more cellophane. There's a bit more packaging. Mm -hmm. There's a bit more something. Where in France, in France, in Italy, definitely even more. You touch more. You smell more. You see more. You feel more. And I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying like if the distance is shorter between you and the food, the relationship is going to be different. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a, like a more intimate relationship with food. And maybe you're going to be able to detect or sense better food this way, I mm -hmm. think. And there's this bizarre tendency I've noticed where French people will point out to me how shocked they are at the serving sizes and the quantities in the United States. And Americans will be shocked by how small the dishes will often be here in France. So there's clearly a different relationship with regards to quantity even, mm -hmm. which you know doesn't necessarily say anything about quality, but oftentimes it does, right? Like if there's an emphasis on the quantity, Yes, it's hard to maintain prices if, if, if you have like so much of this stuff. I've, I had this experience in the US many times. I would go to a sandwich joint, sandwich place, and they, and they do amazing sandwiches. They've got like crazy reviews on Google. Mm. And I would get there and I would get like the special from them. And now I'm, I'm looking at this enormous sandwich and I'm thinking, it doesn't look bad. But the ratios are completely off on this. <laughs> a sandwich is not only about the fillings. Right. It's about the bread. Yeah, yeah. And they are neglecting the bread. And, and I'm thinking with this amount of meat inside, it should be crazy expensive. Yeah. Unless they use lo lower quality meat then. I, I can't remember if they used lo lower quality meats or not. But I, I just thought this is a very different approach to how I would have tackled this or how I would have seen this tackle in a, in a boulangerie here in Paris. Like, it's, it's hard to make this dish possible, mm -hmm. real. So, yeah, quality, definitely a difference. Quantity, yes. But, um, but I feel like things have been challenged very recently. It, where? In the United States or in the world? Bo both. Yeah. In, if, we, if we just take the example of France and the U.S., I feel like the quality of food has improved drastically, depending on, it depends, but like it has improved drastically in the US. I feel like I can find amazing food in the US. A lot more like organic stuff. Is that yes, kind of what you're referring it's very to? pricey though. Yeah, it is. Super pricey. Where in France, for example, people have this, especially, so I've got a specific position where I'm based in Paris. I was born in Paris. I've been living in Paris my whole life. But at the same time, I'm making content for a foreigner audience. Like the French audience of my channel is 3%. Yeah. Wow. That's like same for me. That's crazy. That's the same for you? Pretty much. It's a, it's a okay. very, very small percentage actually. Okay. Yeah. Is it good or is it bad? I don't know. I kinda... Are you better off with uh, 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 fewer French in your audience or like do you want more? I think I'd like more Frenchies. Honestly, okay. but it's okay. okay. I, I can't expect anything else considering I do most of what I do in English, right? So, mm. and, and not, not because there's plenty of French people that speak English, but 
Uh, not that many, apparently. Because, like, for example, I've got I've got a good German audience, oh, and, and yeah. that's not their first language. Interesting. Yeah. So I feel like it's it's like it might be deliberate, or like, or like it might just be might just not connect. Maybe that. But, the, but French YouTube is quite developed. It's very developed. It, you know, it's outside very developed. of the English market, yes. the French one has to be amongst the biggest in yes. terms of foreign languages. It's um, massive. So it's kind of a, a pro and a con, right? Like the, the French are good at doing their own thing, it seems like, but then that creates their own bubble. They know? don't need it. They don't need English speaking folks, yeah. especially ones that are, were born in Paris. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's very rude. So, okay. so anyway, you, you're, you are mentioning that you're, you're from Paris and grew up here. I feel like I cut off a point that you yes. were about to make. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've got a very unique position where uh, I was born in Paris. I've been living here my whole life, but at the same time, I'm making content for a foreign audience. Mm. So, I'm sending them a vision of things somehow. I'm sending them. I'm sharing with them an insider's point of view of things over here. And I feel like I'm. This is also part of my job to make sure that they don't have or that they don't cling to cliches too much. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have, I should check, but I don't think I have like an, a snail's video on my channel or frog's legs video on my channel. This is still a common thing yeah, it is. For, for people from, coming from the US. It's a big stereotype. To, yeah, 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 it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Nobody eats that, nobody. Maybe maybe occasionally, escargot, occasionally maybe but the if you go legs, to I've Lyon, done it once in three years. if you go to Burgundy or like specific yeah. places where the dish is famous or it comes from there, or like there's a specific fair known for this. There's a bit of folklore associated to it, right. maybe. But in Paris, in a random cafe around Gare du Nord, don't don't order snails yeah. around Gare du Nord. Don't do this. But so this is so, interesting so, yeah, because pardon. I mean, right now your channel is is just Alex. But before yeah. it used to be called, what was it, Alex French Guy? No, it was just called French Guy Cooking. French Guy Cooking. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So did you feel like earlier in your career you played into some of the... Yes, of course. Okay. I, I, I still am to some extent, I think. I'm, I'm not trying to correct my accent, for example. I'm not trying to not be French. I, I'm squeezing it for a few extra points. Okay. <laughs> okay. But now it's just a side thing. It's just one of the things. Right. In the past, I thought, when I started my YouTube channel, I thought, well, I'm interested in food in general. I'm interested in cooking. If I call it this way, maybe I'll get a bit more views from SEO or things like this. Maybe, right. maybe people are going to click more, click more with, with the video and click more on the video as well. Uh, just because in the name there is French and cooking at the same time. Because I thought French cooking must have a reputation abroad. I, I wasn't it does. Yeah, but I wasn't aware that there's, this is a double -edged, it's a double-edged sword to some extent. Really? Yeah, because then you're associated with uh, something stuffy and chefy right. and overcomplicated and like snob, snobbish yeah. to some extent. So then I had to fight uh, to fight against it at some point. I thought, whoa, I'm limiting myself. I'm cornering myself into something. Now people only expect French recipes from me, but that's not who I am. Right. In fact, at home, I rarely cook French dishes. Right. So I thought, wow, we, we, we need to pivot. And then I pivoted. Yeah, just a buff bourguignon maybe every two weeks, right? M maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> but once a month, maybe, if yeah. it's in the freezer. <laughs> right, right. If you can figure out, I don't know, how, if you consistently can do the one hour. Exactly. I thought that was amazing. My was gosh. Funny one. So, okay, so we talked about uh, ingredients, which, you know, of course, like, <laughs> I'm bringing all these things up with the thinking of like the analogies for life, right? And the implications that you mm -hmm. can consider outside of food, mm -hmm. even just within food, it's fascinating. But I think life is composed of ingredients, but it's also, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna say something. Yeah, I might argue with this. Oh, what do you mean? I think so. I, so it's just for the beauty of the argument. Yeah, obviously. go for it. But I feel like there's an analogy, but it, 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 it shouldn't be too literal. It shouldn't be too direct. It's almost like a recipe can start because we can pick the ingredients. Most of it. You, you can pick the quality of ingredients you want for the recipe. In life, you're, you start with whatever you have, yeah. right? And then you, and, and maybe there's less of a sense of like good and bad. It's just like what you have. But you can also, yes, absolutely. You, you, you start with what you've got and, and there are many things you cannot control, which is part of life. Life, yeah. But 
I think um, to to some extent you you can maybe acquire an additional ingredient or mm. um, orient yourself towards different ingredients, right? Mm. Like, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, it's not necessarily possible to have a complete reset. But no, no, for sure, and also it could be it could be less of a direct translation where for example in life at some point you realize that what what matters is like to have important um, values for example Mm -hmm. and they could be the prime ingredients of your your recipe your Mm -hmm. inner recipe i want to be sincere i want to be caring i want to be courageous and these are the ingredients i should be working with yeah and if these are good the outcome, whatever it is, sh- shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, exactly. And that, yeah. I think, I mean, hopefully, we have some level of influence on on an individual level, right? Yes. But then I also think about people, right? You know, like people are kind of ingredients. And mm. if there's, uh, you know, a, a negative dynamic taking place, I mean, it's going to depend on the situation, right. if you work at it, right. or sometimes it makes sense to not have that exist in your life, right? And that's choosing ingredients as well, picking to whatever extent you can, the mm. kinds of people you surround yourself with, right? I mean, it makes a lot of sense, yeah, for yeah. sure. So continuing this analogy, if you will, I wanted to ask you about tools mm-hmm. because that's another thing that really stands out mm-hmm. to me in your videos. Like, first of all, the studio is just amazing. I just love all of, you know, you'll sometimes open the fridge and it'll just be packed with every possible kind of ingredient. You open my fridge, you're up for a riot sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> But it's I, like deep into madness. Immediately, you open the fridge and there is only semola. Yeah. <laughs> Semolina from top to bottom. All yeah. different kinds, like so many different brands. And I just close the fridge as soon as possible so that people don't see it too much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's one of the secrets hidden in there. Um, but also the machines. I mean, uh, your your uh, sous vide machine and the, the different, I mean, the machines that you use to make the pasta and... Mm. Um, yeah. You were talking about the right pan to use for the paella, yes. right? Like, you know, do you uh, do you believe? It, sometimes I'm inclined to believe that there's a lot of recipes you just can't make if you don't have the right tool. I think there are. Yes, I think it's it's, it's pretty correct to assume that. I think I I believe in the tools in general. I believe in like the the, the, the quality of the tool. I you don't have to have all the tools, but they do make a difference. Do you feel it's as important as having? The right ingredients, like the right tools. No, no, it's not no, as important. Not, not as important because I could make a good dish with my hands. Okay, but I, if you give me a great knife and a bad ingredient, probably just gonna do nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I feel like I, I, assuming that you can start with like decent quality ingredients or like good quality ingredients, the tools will make a difference. Mm-hmm. A sharp knife will make a difference, a hundred percent. You don't have to have like geeky tools like the ones I use in my videos. Sometimes I use them for show purposes. Sometimes I use the I use them because I'm 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 pursuing very very specific missions that people rarely tackle mm-hmm. in their life. How to dry semolina based pasta at home? No, 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 nobody does that. So that's why I have to have very specific tools. Super geeky, super tech sometimes, but it's undeniable that tools will help you, you know, get to the point you want, you want, you want to get to. Yeah. Is there a single most important tool in the kitchen? In your opinion, obviously yes. this is, oh, what is it? It's the knife. The knife. It's the knife. Yeah. It's hard to replace the knife. Yeah. And also it's, it's maybe there's a philosophical tool in the kitchen that is more useful and it's, it could be awareness in general. Okay. using your senses but is that really a tool or is it more of a technique maybe it's probably more of a technique but like in terms of tool i'd say i'd say the knife is unbeatable what do you mean by awareness in the kitchen like just knowing where everything is or the timing of things or it's like it's almost like we're going to do a meditation it's like be present when you're cooking not in the sense that be aware of the emotions or like the thoughts but, but more like be aware of what's happening in front of you can you smell something burning? Mm-hmm. What about this sound? Does it sound watery or does it sound dry? Mm-hmm. Is it starting to attach to the bottom of the pan? You, you can tell just by the sound. You know, when you've got vegetables in a pan, at first the sound is a bit wet when you're heating them up. Like, like the sound is pretty gentle, but at some point it starts cracking. Mm-hmm you know, crackling, you've, you've got like dry sound. It's, it's saying something, but are you willing to listen to it? 
Are, are you open to listen to it? That's what I meant when I said, just be present when you're cooking. It's less of a meditation thing, but more like a, be like a cat almost. You know how cats are. They see things, they hear things, they, they flinch immediately when something happens. And uh, this is, this is a super, this, I, I don't think it's a tool, but it's, it's a super, super useful skill in general. Because then you can detect what problems are ahead of you and you can try to correct them can lower the heat you can take something off you can chop them smaller because you can see that clearly this is not cooking this is the, the chunks are too big it's, a, it's almost like a, a bit of a common sense mixed with uh, uh, an availability for any stimuli stim, stimuli that comes through your senses so that would that would be sorry it's a bit of a digression but no, it's, no, it's, this it's, is it's definitely a, a technique but in terms of tools tools yeah the knife a chef knife any chef knife like probably eight inches long pretty okay. sharp it doesn't have to be expensive but doesn't have to be too cheap either yeah okay i'm sorry i have to drill down on this awareness point it's so fascinating to me um how did you learn that or how did you develop that awareness in the kitchen and, uh, and uh, when did it happen because sometimes I'm following, I feel like um, in cooking in general, people follow recipes very often. It takes, I'm not saying everybody, I'm not saying nobody freestyle in the kitchen, freestylers in the kitchen, but I'm saying most of people will follow steps and process. Why? Because uh, improvising or like dealing with what you have and being open, really cooking, I'm, I'm talking, not just reheating something is complicated. It requires a bit of expertise, a bit of experience, a bit of confidence as well, a bit of inspiration, like, like some sort of a back, uh, a, a back catalog at, at the back of your mind. What can I do with this? How can I pair this? And trust, right? You and tr trust. And trust, yeah. exactly. And also forgiveness, because it might, it might end up bad. It might, you, might, you might waste some ingredients, because it might be wrong. So are you able to accept that? Very hard. For, for, many for many people around me, and in general, it's very hard. So people tend to uh, like the comfort and the reassurance of recipes in general. So they will follow steps. The problem is that when you follow steps, you are putting the authority in, in, another's, in, in another's people's hand, basically. You are trusting somebody else. You're basically giving up on responsibility. If it fails, it's not my fault. It's the recipe's fault. Mm -hmm. And this way, you're also shutting down the, um, your mental awareness of things. It's, it's, it, I don't have to be aware of things. I don't have to be present for, for the zucchinis in the pan. I don't have to check them. The recipe said three minutes. I'm going to follow three minutes. Well, it turns out it doesn't, it doesn't work like this. A recipe is just a, a canvas. It's just like a, it's, it's a structure. It's a plan of things that could go right, but ideally, but, but just in an ideal world. Because like in reality, on your stove, at home, with not the zucchini he used, with not the stove he used, things are going to go off and you're going to have to adapt to things. And so I feel like adaptation, it's, it's, it's awareness, but it could be adaptation. And, and I feel like this is something that, we don't develop so much because of recipes, because it's like scary, because we like to stick to things that are solid and it's just reassuring for us. It's crazy to think that like uh, cooking is so scary for people. I really, I mean, I had a glimpse of that in the past. I thought, I know that mm, some people don't like cooking for obscure reasons for me. And then over the years, I have really understood that people are terrified about this. Mm -hmm ruining ingredients like wasting money wasting time uh, having a bad image of themselves maybe as well, well so I, giving... I feel afraid of the judgment you know i'll the judgment, cook something yes. poorly and it's just embarrassing it's embarrassing yeah but at the same time <laughs> i think it's embarrassing yeah right and and it's just like it's it's like almost like it's it's hurting themselves when when they are producing a dish that they think is bad or that they think is a waste or I don't think so. Mm. It would be very rude to, to just consider, to, to just <laughs> judge a dish that you made, for example. You serve me a dish and the dish is cooked this way or that way. And maybe the correct way to do it is this way or that way. It would be very rude, inappropriate for me to judge it in any way. I feel like 
you're not serving me a dish. You're spending a moment with me. Mm. You're just doing something for me, for, for like the, the meeting, for example, for the encounter. I respect that very much. Mm. I don't feel that... I, I don't think people are that judgmental when it comes to other people's dishes. Way more about themselves. It says so much about people in general. We are so harsh with ourselves. So critical, so judgmental. So, And with friends... No, we are a little more forgiving. That friend is doing whatever he can. He's, he did a fine job, I think. And it's a gesture. Yeah, exactly. With ourselves, no, I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. This is, I'm so bad at this. It's just, it's just like a pure reflection of how we treat ourselves in general, the way we treat our dishes. But I feel like, yeah, with a bit of experience, with a bit, bit of practice, a few failures, and maybe a teacher on YouTube that can show you that he also fails a lot. Maybe it's just going to bring things down a yeah. bit and people are just going to, you know, relax, chill and think, well, Alex burnt it. So I've got a free pass. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the point of awareness, though, it was just after spending enough time in the kitchen that you began to be like, OK, I've got to pay attention to these things. Yes. Yeah. It's it's pure experience, I think. It's, yeah. it's just about like cooking things over and over and over and over and then realizing that there are many bits of information that I've missed Basically, for example, there's a dish that I've been practicing forever, forever. Like uh, it's it's the French classic omelette. Okay. This one, like the beautiful, I don't know how you call this shape. I, I'm lacking the vocabulary to 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 define this. Oval. Shape. But it's oval, but it's pointy at the end at the same time. Okay. It's like an eye almost, like a beautiful yeah. eye. That's a good way of describing it. I had no idea yeah. how to describe it in any other yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's silky smooth and it's pale it's supposed to be silky smooth it's okay. supposed to be pale yellow and to be to have some sort of a skin on the outside pretty delicate and to be very fluffy mm -hmm. very moist very um, rich on the inside and to have only eggs you can have many things inside but like the classic it would have nothing and it would still be amazing when you say only eggs you mean like don't add no any cream, milk no cream no milk okay. no cheese no, no cheating no nothing yeah 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 otherwise you cheat on this and, and it's just a matter of technique Why is that and cheating? presence. It's not cheating. I'm, I'm just saying that dish can be obtained. You're right. I think you're right. <laughs> this is something about me. I love being right. But when somebody makes a good point, I love being wrong. I'm just curious. But because... it's, it's, you're right. There's no reason why that dish would be wrong with something inside, inside of it. It would be amazing. By the way, with cheese, it's even better most of the time. Right. But, but you I'm, have a vision for this. You, yeah, you want to create the perfect exactly. omelette with just eggs. I'm thinking about cheating with myself, basically. Yeah. I wanted to be able to do this dish and to understand it to the core, basically. I wanted really to have an understanding of that omelette dish without spoiling my judgment with like exterior ingredients right. external ingredients because if i add cheese and if i have beautiful herbs am i still judging my technique it's hard because it's like hidden behind beautiful ingredients yeah. if there's nothing if there's a mistake it's going to shine very brightly right. so i'm going to take the mistakes in right into my face so i've been practicing this omelette dish for a while and this is how for example, on dish like this, that I've developed that presence when I cook. When you do it once, you don't know what's happening. You just throw the eggs, whisk them, put them in a pan, whiskey, whiskey. You, you, you try to stir it in the pan. You, you turn it upside down on a plate. You've got somehow of an omelette and it works. It can't be bad, to be honest. It can't be bad. But you didn't pay attention to what happened. The sound the eggs made when they hit the pan was wrong. There, was a, there wasn't enough sound, for example. It needed to sizzle, like bad. The fat wasn't bubbling properly. The smell wasn't nutty enough because the heat wasn't, wasn't high enough. The timing was wrong because like the curds which were forming in the pan were either too loose, too watery, or too set. There's a right moment and it's visual, it's visual, but you can also feel it with like the fork. By the way, I'm, I'm stirring in a nonstick with a fork, which is like a big no-no. But usually I'm using like the spoon side of the fork. It's no, why, always why very a fork? Why, why not a different tool? 
I so very often I use a, a wooden, <laughs> but it's just like it's the perfect tool for this because okay. you've got teeth which are great to gather the edges and everything that is forming on the sides of the pan. But also you've got like the the round part of the of the fork which is great. I would argue with this, but not to scratch a non-stick pan. Okay. If you're very gentle and you almost doesn't touch the the, the bottom. So it's just a perfect tool for omelet. So that's so. I have so many questions from what you're saying here. Like, wh why would you, if it's a big no-no, how can that be the perfect tool? Like, how can I, this be? I don't so think great? it is. I don't think it is. The perfect tool would be a non-stick fork, or like, or like a plastic fork of some kind, or like a wooden fork. I wasn't able to find like a good wooden wooden fork. Okay. So I'm still using a metal fork, but in my case. It is the perfect tool because I'm not using a non-stick pan. Okay. I'm using a normal pan. I'm using a steel pan. Okay. So I'm not going to scratch anything. Okay, so it doesn't matter. But at home, if people were to do an omelette, obviously they shouldn't use a metal a metal fork because they're going to ruin the the, the the thing and there's going to be different bits in the omelette. Not the right type of like dusting that you want. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, that's not the thing. But um, yeah, this is the, making an omelette is a good example of um, trying to develop your, your presence, mm -hmm. your awareness to sharpen your your senses your senses and your sensors in some ways is it better it, you really intrigued me when you said uh that you're practicing right and you're it seems like you're testing different things out you're learning what the right sound is like all these different elements to making this perfect omelet when experimenting is it better to change one element at a time or do you find you're changing a whole bunch of different things mm. like you have six new ideas you're going to try them all at once that's 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 fascinating as a question i think <laughs> cuz i this is this is um i come from a scientific background yeah so i was trained as an engineer electrical engineer mm -hmm. which means that inside of me i've got this experimental approach. I don't know if it's the right term, but this is like you only change one variable at a time. Otherwise, you are not able to identify where the problems come from. But at the same time, as a creative person, because I've been fighting between these two sides of my personality forever, it's great to have like super random tryouts or super random variations. Because then you explore way more and way faster and you fail way faster as well. Change all the variables and then explore a completely different route. And then you're going to know immediately if something is exciting or intriguing in that route. Instead of just changing one variable at a time and being very safe, it's all well and good. It's very controlled, but it's also a little boring. It's also, it serves a different purpose maybe. So I feel like, I, I don't know if there's a, an answer to this. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Very often at the beginning of developing a new recipe, I will have the creative approach. Mm -hmm. Be wild. Stop limiting yourself. Experiment with whatever. Try. Nobody has done it. We don't care. Experiment with like the, the cooking techniques or the ingredients set up or like the techniques that I use or like the season, whatever. Be really open-minded. And I think I'm doing a good job in general at being super open-minded with things like this. But once I've narrowed it down to a few options, then I can switch to being more analytical. And then I can switch to changing one variable at a time and mm. optimizing things. But I feel it's like, it's like for different, two different timings almost. Now, one particular, that's a great answer. I love that. But one particular moment that stands out is, you know, um, that episode that you did in your pasta series where you said, or the title was something like, this was supposed to be the finale. You're in bad shape, right? And at that point, you end the episode not sure where the problem is. Anywhere in the process, you're questioning everything. Mm. At that point, are you basically having to start from scratch again? Because I felt a bit, I mean, mm. I'm, I'm caught up in the emotion of the series as well, right? And I feel overwhelmed. I'm like, damn, I, I don't even know where he would begin mm. to answer this. And, I, and it, it was fascinating that the way you answered this was going and working for someone who is an expert and you could see the whole process. Mm. So that was a genius idea. But like in a situation like that, do you have to return to the creative exploration mode? It, it, was, a, it was very faithful to reality. I was stuck. I failed, you know, down miserably. And then I realized... 
the things that I was doing so far did not work. Right. And like all the routes that I had explored were blocked. And I thought I need a hard reset. And you said it was like a genius move to go back to train with Luciano, like the, the master pasta maker in, in Rome. This was the only option I had. So I'm glad it was good because that was the only one. You said something, by the way, sorry, this, is, this really caught my attention too. You asked him in that episode when you went to work with him if he had seen the series. So you were already posting episodes of the series? Sometimes, yes. And then you ran into this failure? Like, yeah. that's terrifying. To that me. is terrifying. That is a little too much, to be honest. I mean, that is, that is crazy stressful because you obviously yes. want to have some kind of positive mm. resolution. What was that like? It was, it's, it's like, that's where my work also has challenges, I think. Because, yeah. like, I am making documentary-style series mm -hmm. where I document reality, what's happening, something I'm discovering as I go. But at the same time, yes, I'm doing all the work in advance, I'm scouting locations, I'm, you know, uh, chatting with folks. I, with, with the current setup, I, I can do video chat with folks in advance. I can try to explore subjects and try to make sure that there is something, there is some story to be told in this direction. But at the same time, I'm not entirely sure, mm -hmm. especially with subject that deep, that complicated, uh, like like the dry the dry pasta series where I didn't know it was going to be that complicated. I thought it was going to be complicated. I sensed that there was a depth to this world, this food field, but I didn't know it was going to be that complicated. And then at some point I failed because I thought, well, well, I failed and then I was miserable. And so I made an episode about being miserable in all this. And... And I mean, the series did not end exactly where I thought it would end. I thought it was going to be like a, a resounding success. And it was more like a, it depends how you see it. Well, if I see it, I'm going to see um, a fail. But if I see it with more forgiving eyes, I would say a reasonable success. Because I was able to dry pasta. Not all types of pasta, not exactly the ones that I wanted. But I was able to dry pasta in some ways. So what do you honestly feel? Do you feel it's a failure or do you feel it was a reasonable I success? I feel like I wasn't able to crack the code. I Which is all... frustrating for you. Yes. Yeah, I, I was that. able to crack pasta a lot because like they crack when they dry. But in the end, if it depends on the goal I've set to myself. The goal wasn't really to dry pasta. It was more to understand what's happening. And at that success for sure because mm -hmm. i have a, a, a crazy and uh, not crazy maybe i'm overreacting or like overstating it whatever i mean after working on it for months i'd yeah. be surprised if you didn't have a crazy yeah. understanding about exactly this. I've, I've got like a deep understanding of how pasta are made and why they are what they are and this is giving me loads of satisfaction mm -hmm. just whenever i'm i'm sitting somewhere or eating somewhere or in a grocery store and i look at pasta and i'm thinking well i know I know what's happening. Wow. I know this that stuff that only costs one one buck on the shelf. It's just like commodity, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know that some something's magical is happening in, inside that package. So this is good. At the same time, I was enabled, and that's a, that's also a little funny. I wasn't too bad. I wasn't able to crack the code that industrial have been working on for hundreds of years. Mm. So I'm thinking, well. Maybe accept your limitations. Mm, wow. But I'm also thinking this must have changed how you even see Italy, just in general, right? Mm. The country, the people. Very much. No, very everything. much. And also, like, I, I, I think I had, I have, like, a, a good, you know, uh, insight, a good overview of Italy's cuisine in general, like a, a decent one. And it depends on the standards. But I understand a bit of Italian cuisine. And yet I had underestimated vastly the importance of pasta in Italy. Mm -hmm. Pasta is so, so much more than I thought it was. It's like the DNA of Italy. And I thought it was more like, you know, pizza could compete to some extent. No, no, no. Pizza is no match. It's not a controversial statement to make. Maybe it is. Do you think but it's people good. agree with you? I don't, I, don't, I don't know, maybe, but I feel like pasta is like more family. Can you imagine if that's the title of this episode? Go for it. Alex 
says pasta is more important than pizza. I think so. Because <laughs> pasta has something to do with family. In Italy. Yeah. It's something every mom makes pasta for the kids. Right. And like pizza, yes, there are many families who do pizza, but at the same people go to pizzeria in Italy. Mm. It's, it's more of a like, a, and I've got m so many Italian friends. And, and I know how pizza... I know the importance of pizza. I've made a, an entire, I made two series about like Neapolitan pizzas, but I'm, I just feel like there is something more intimate. There's a, there's, there's a stronger relationship with like pasta. It's like deeper. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to shine brighter. Mm -hmm. It's just there. Yeah. So the criticisms that you receive, if somebody's like, you're so wrong about this or whatever, uh, are you able to just kind of, act like or whatever let that pass you know i mean if if if, I, if if the comment is you are so wrong about this recipe um, this i mean i'm gonna be truly honest this is not a comment that i see often okay so wrong wrong yes so wrong like everything in what i did is wrong well, this is hardly some something that i see because i right. feel like it's it's not it's not it's not related to me any person who needs to do a recipe we'll just try to get at least one or two recipes mm -hmm. online and try to follow something with a bit of legitimacy so i can't be completely wrong about this but i can definitely be wrong in many aspects in the dish but it depends who who is the person right. who's who's that person i, I don't even want to know it i would be i wouldn't be annoyed by this because mm -hmm. i feel like i'm older now and i shouldn't be i, sh I shouldn't be but if, like, for example, a friend of mine, an Italian chef, tells me, well, Alex, this is wrong, then I'll, I'll be a little more worried about this. Okay. I'm going to think, number one, he's a friend. Number two, he's Italian. Number three, he's a chef. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should definitely reconsider. There's a problem over here. And I will definitely accept criticism from reputable, legitimate sources. And I love these feedback. And I will... The truth is... They give it to me only once. I, I absorb it, and next time they see me, I won't do the same mistake again. I will make it my own. And now it's mine forever. What they just gave me, it's mine now. It's not theirs anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's the comments. I mean, you've been doing YouTube videos for four years as well. Yeah, almost the, 10 years as well, actually. I'm on year eight, I think, or something like that. So. Dealing with the comments is, is like a long process. The, your relationship with the audience, and especially with the comments, yeah. is like a love-hate relationship. Yeah. I mean, I there's a lot of love there, too. You know, yeah, people are very a lot supportive. Of it. Yeah. But you're so right to put comments or any kind of feedback into different categories, right? Because it could be very valuable if it's a comment that's very insightful, but it's also, you don't know where that's coming from or who mm -hmm. that is. And that's kind of the amazing and also the challenging thing about the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Like anyone can say anything. Yes. And not having a filtration system for that is how you go insane. The, the, the fun thing I think about these comments, so like for example, let's say I, I make a, a two part, two part episode. And in the first one, I make a recipe. In the second one, you've got half, the second half of the recipe, for example. And in the first one, somebody comments, you shouldn't do it like this. You should do it like da, 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 da. Okay. And in the second episode, which have been shot at the same time, by the way, I correct the mistake in the video, at least. And then I do it the right way. And then the person said, I told, pardon. And sorry, I get passionate. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and the, the same guy comment on the second video and say, I told you, you should thank me. Right. Well, first, first and foremost, these videos have been written two months ago yeah. and been, it been shot a month ago and both of them at the same time. So, okay. Can you imagine if it was that comment that changed everything? Like, <laughs> That would be funny. And the, the fun thing is that the person is not making a comment about my video. Yeah. He's making a comment about his state, yeah. about his being right or wrong or his voice, which he thinks should matter more. And I should be listening more to this guy. Well, obviously, from a reasonable point of view, there are thousand more comments on this video, and I can't possibly listen to all of them. And also, as you said, who is he? Mm -hmm. Who is that person? He might be legitimate, he might not. And the problem is not that he's relevant or not. The problem is that I can't figure it out. I don't know. I have no clues. So I can't listen to a random comments. Mm -hmm. it, it, I would like to, 
if the person says, well, I'm a chef and, and, I, and I've got proof that this person is this and that and he's really doing this to help me, great, I'll use that. But since, since it's impossible, I, I'm just going to stop beating myself up. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, I'll look at your comment section and I, it's almost like an enhancement to the video sometimes. Yes. There's a lot of great suggestions. It's kind of crazy. Amazing. Um, and that's the really cool advantage of reaching a lot of people when you do what you do, laying it out, and then people from the exact region, uh, you know, amazing. where the dishes that you're trying to replicate come from, can can add insights. And usually they're very very kind, very supportive. Very kind, yes. Uh, yes. But does it ever happen to you to read a comment and they make a great suggestion? You're like, ah, I should have thought of that. Yes, yes, it happens. And also that's that's it's connected to. It's connected to the problem that I see in the construction of my series. Since I, I made some of it, most of it in advance. Right, and you it's can't know. Exactly. That's the problem. You I didn't can't know, know that, and it's also stupid because I feel like I have access to a cluster of brains, yeah. and people know so many stuffs. Yeah. For example, when I'm tackling an engineering problem in my video. Yeah. For example, let's say, um, I'm dealing with extrusion. Force, trying to force some matter through a die and dealing with the heat and the forces that are generated. I have an understanding of this because I've been doing research, but in the audience, in the comment, there is this one guy, he's an engineer and he does extrusion for a living and he's being very kind and he's being very polite and he just tells me, no, Alex, the problem comes from this factor. Yeah. And I'm just like... Ah. I wish I knew this early on. I wish the series was really, you know, written and shot as it, as it goes, but it's impossible. But that's part of the journey, right? You're usually able to incorporate this in the narrative that you're telling, right? I'm, try, I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, I, you're saying that I can't incorporate it or I'm, I should be or? No, I think you do a good job of showing the journey, the journey of like, I screwed up here, you know, and, and now I'm going to make this change or whatever. Um, yes, but the problem is that sometimes I can't. Yeah, I can't. no, 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 totally. Yeah, because like, for example, the, 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 I've got the next three episodes after this one. I can't change the whole thing. Yeah. I can try to amend, but then I've also got to work with the cards, with yeah. the cards that I've got. But I think what's cool about what you do is that it's not really, I mean, you give a lot of great insights and tips and techniques and whatnot, but it's not really always about finally figuring out the perfect final result. It's it's a guy trying to figure it out. That's yes. the really fascinating yes. part. And I think there's more takeaways from watching someone approach something mm -hmm. enthusiastically yeah. and with a ton of curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it really exciting. Because, you know, realistically, how many people in the audience are actually replicating what you're doing? Nobody. Probably nobody. Nobody. Which is... I mean, yeah, nobody. And that's that's kind of a... That's actually cool in and of itself because you know you're really doing something original. Yes. You're in, you're in no man's land. The, the purpose is definitely to inspire them, yeah. to bring confidence to them. Uh, mentioning that the comment section is more than just a reaction, but it's also part of the content. Yeah. That's, is ama that's amazing. I feel like, especially with an audience that is, I'd, I'd, I'd say, pretty polite, pretty kind, pretty yeah. caring, my, like, like mine is. I have yet to meet mean people, like mm. angry people in food. I mean, they exist, obviously. But most of the time, if you show that you care, if, if I show that I've been putting some work into this, I've been trying not to offend your entire country by doing this, people are just going to be, all right, well, so this is wrong. And I'm going to tell you what my mom did or like what my friend who is a chef did. And maybe we can, you can add this to your repertoire or maybe you can just leave that in the comment, pin it so that anybody can see it. Right. And I will do that immediately. Because I feel like, yeah, great. Then I'm using, then I'm benefiting, then we are all benefiting from something that is truly amazing on YouTube. Like yeah. the audience, the audience has like an evil side and a, and a, and a, and a God sent side to yeah. it. It's like you are having access to thousands or millions of brains, millions of minds, millions of different people with like millions of different opinions and, and, and ways and perspectives on the world. Fascinating, amazing, brilliant. You're also dealing with like millions of like reactions and emotions. So a little touchy, but when it works, that's amazing. Now, have you ever done a video, and this is bigger than just a single comment. Have you ever done a video where the, general reaction surprised you? Yes. 
Do you have any specific examples of it's that? It's a painful one for me. But oh, yeah. no, no, it's not, okay with no, sharing? No, it's not too painful. It's it like, often is a painful one, though. I, I mean, yeah. I have my own examples that are difficult. Okay, okay. so I'll, I'll, I'll share it for sure. It's, it's not really painful, but it is a bit. So I was doing a series about, what was it? I think it was about bread or was it about pizza? Anyways, at some point I decided that I needed to turn my world upside down one more time and turn my studio into a professional bakery. And I thought I need the tools of the trade. I need to buy a professional stand mixer. The one that, you know, that, that can mix and whisk. Uh, you're talking in quarts, maybe. So, <laughs> so maybe a few quarts. It's like, it's like probably 12 liters, 24 liters of like dough. Okay, wow. it's, it's like enormous. Like you see the mixing bowl of that stuff. It's like this big. Yeah. So I needed something like this. Okay, so I went and, and met a few dealers of these. It's pretty pricey, so I thought I'm going to buy something secondhand. And it's all narrated in a video. And this is the video that is a bit painful. Uh, and at some point I decided, so I found one on, on the French equivalent of Craigslist. I went to the guy, the machine seemed okay, it needed a bit, uh, it needed a bit of a renovation, but I thought it's going to be... It's going to be fun to see me, you know, disassembling the thing and painting it again and making sure that everything is clean and putting it back together. Even from an engineering point of view, I was a bit excited about this. Bought the thing, brought it back to my studio, started disassembling the thing. I had the paint, I had everything. And then I found bugs inside of it. Bugs inside of it, inside, like, inside the covers, I found bugs. I found roaches, but th oh, yeah. But but um, but that can be fixed, right? You just clean them all out. That's the problem. So so that's where people. That's uh -oh. where I'm a human being, and I've got my own flaws to deal with. Uh -oh. I've got severe bugophobia. <gasps> oh wow! And when I there, there are things I'm okay with. For example, spiders. I can have a spider on my hand. I'm fine with it. But a roach, no. Like snakes. I don't like snakes that much, but I'm I'm fine with it. It's like. But roaches, I've got, I've got oh. something that I can't control about them. God. It's, like, it's like, I wish I could, but I can't. Yeah. And I've been trying to in my life. This is something I'm aware of. And I've been, you know, exposing myself, but it just, just doesn't work with me. Mm. And I've been, I've been doing skydiving, for example. So I love it. It's, it's scary, but I, I love it. So I, I think everybody's different. And this is one of my flaws in this and I, one of my fears. And I open it and I see these roaches and I close the door. I'm just like, I'm not doing this. I can't do this. It's impossible. It's just like too much. And I'm trying to clean it, trying to overcome it. And it, this, is all, this is all off camera. And then I'm starting to shoot things. And then at some point I discover more and more and more. And I'm thinking, I don't want this in my kitchen. Yeah. This is not safe in my kitchen. And this is my space in the end. This is the space where my, rule, uh, my rules apply. And... I don't want this to contaminate my space. And then I posted the video. So you shared this whole journey. Yes. Man, you really tell the story. I love yes, that. Yeah. I love that. And then I shared, I shared this. As, I, I, I posted that episode on YouTube. And the reaction was, if I say it was bad, I would be unfair with what happened. The videos that I post, very luckily for me, or for whatever reason, they get a very good like to dislike ratio. Like super good. I don't know what I don't I don't even know if videos in general get a bad ratio, but mine get over and that's just a state over ninety five percent like to dislike ratio. So I'm thinking people like my video, mm -hmm. and this video got seventy five percent, so way lower. Yeah. It still means that out of four people, three people like it. But that's a big chunk of people that didn't like it. But that's still a pretty significant chunk of people who didn't like wow. it. And the, the main reaction was like. Alex, you're being a wimp or you're being a pussy. No way. Yeah, you shouldn't do this. You should just clean it. But the problem is that, so I was annoyed by this reaction. I thought, well, I can't do much about this. I wish I could, but I can't do much. But then I realized I, it wasn't really their fault either. In the sense that I did not share enough of background. I should have told them that I was that I've been suffering from this type of phobia forever. Right. So since I did not share this in the video, it was harder to understand why this guy was so annoyed by something as minimal as just, just clean it. 
call it a day, clean everything, discard all this, disinfect if you want to disinfect, whatever, and just fix that machine. Mm -hmm. But it was deeper than this, but it was too intimate for me to share. I was not comfortable with sharing something like a fear that I have had for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a recipe for failure, that video. They were disappointed and I was disappointed. And in the end, in the end it was just one video. I mean, it was just a video, pardon. But um, yeah, it told me something about, about, um, about the process. It told me if you want them to understand, you have to open up. Yeah. If you don't open up, don't expect them to understand. You're not giving them what you want. You think it's just for privacy? Fine. But then just accept the reaction they have because they can only react with what you feed them with. And so that was that was that wasn't the best experience, mm -hmm. but that wasn't the worst either because it made me grow. It made me grow to some mm -hmm. extent. Big lesson for sure, and probably you also saw that. I don't know if you felt like the world was ending when that happened. It like did. you're losing, yeah. But it felt clearly, like it. clearly, it did not. It did not. <laughs> it end. did not. And you have this fantastic audience still there. Yeah, and they were forgiving. In the next one, they were just watching something else, and it's just because it's 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 always the case with like. Um, with creators or the creators at least that I've met, our world revolves around this. So for us, it's like a catastrophe, basically. Mm -hmm. What did I do? I messed up. The audience is mad. I shouldn't have done this. This is like a betrayal almost. No, I don't think it is. It was just like a morning coffee for this guy in Tennessee. It was just like watching your video. Oh, Alex. You, 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 you're just being silly, you know, exclamation mark. And then he went back to his life, which has nothing to do with the video right. forever. And so, but for me, it was just like, oh, I've, I've, I've let them down. Yeah. I don't think so. They, they got lives, they got things to attend, jobs, families, real life problem. So, so yeah, it, it was, it was great in that sense, at least. Just to put me back, you know, get get me back down to earth, and also realize that yeah, I messed up, but I can always learn from it, and also they don't care. Yeah, it's crazy to think this because I've been fighting for them to care about my videos for ten years. They don't care. Was this recent? No, it was like probably two years ago, three years okay. ago, something. Yeah, fine. Yeah. But it's just like it's not. They don't care that much. Mm -hmm. They care, yes, but not to that extent. Yeah. Even a mean comment, I don't think they care so much. It's so show, no. It's, it might just be like a reaction, something, something very spontaneous at that moment. But on the long run, they don't, and I shouldn't either. It does seem like people move on very quickly. Yes. You know, you're on yeah. next video. There's like there there's might so be many videos to watch. a couple comments from people that still remember. But then it's like it's gone. It's ancient history pretty soon. Yeah. And now that that, that professional, you know, um, machine is sitting in my basement, it's probably now, you know, crawling with new roaches inside of oh it. Oh, my God. And I'm, I don't know what to do with it. Should I sell it? But if I sell it, I'm being, you know, I feel like I'm going to betray the customer who's going to buy it. Cause just, I, just be upfront about it. Be like, look. It's, it's been it's, sitting in my basement. Yeah. It might be in a bad shape. Are you willing to have it? Yeah, maybe. But at the same time, I want to fix it. There's something inside of oh. me that just says, Alex, you've got a challenge in front You don't like letting Why go not? of something that's unfinished. No, I don't. Yeah. And also, it's not even about the video. I'm thinking, well, now that I know that there is a, like a, a nemesis inside that machine yeah. waiting for me, maybe I can prepare myself and just fight it and maybe not make it a video, maybe not, or maybe just let go and yeah. sell that machine. It would be easier. But I completely agree with this approach. It's like, as soon as I discover I'm afraid of something, mm. I feel like I have to move have towards to. it. Yes. I have to, because that's where life is most interesting. Yes. That's where I grow the most. I think so. That's what I'm here for, right? That's what we're alive, mm. uh, I think, to do. Um, yes. And... Yeah, I can't help myself. So I think some mm -hmm. people don't understand because they don't necessarily operate the same way, and mm -hmm. that's that's okay. But we we grow so much more I when we've so, got yeah. a lack of something. If I try to tackle uh, another skill, or if I just try to grow in this field where I'm already not bad at, 
I'm gonna grow, but in this field where I suck, if I try to fight it, I'm gonna go drastically. Yeah. I'm gonna move very fast. So I'm also, I mean, this is definitely something we share. I, I, it's not exactly that I don't wanna let go. I feel like that's where you grow in general. Mm -hmm. I know it, I've learned it. Everybody knows it, I feel. Do you feel that that's at the root of how you hone in on an idea that you really want to explore? Because I wanted to ask you about this. It's like, where, wh what drives you to go so insanely granular into, into the, the series that you do on these, or like salt or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you'll pick a topic and you'll just go to the root of it. Um, it is it that kind of fear element? Is it that like, ooh, this is mm -hmm. bothering me a little bit, so I need to go towards it? I think it's definitely not the fear. Not fear. Not fear. It's it's uh, it it's more. It's it's very deep. It's very close to something that I feel. It's very close to something that I feel that I am. I think mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by things in general. I'm just genuinely curious, genuinely interested in things I don't. I know nothing about. And so the. Um, the simpler the subject, or like the most common the subject, or like the, the 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 most boring the subject is, the highest are the chances that I'm gonna be interested in, because mm -hmm. I can sense something almost. It's like my spider sense. I can sense that something is happening that people are not telling me. It's not like a conspiracy vibe. It's more like a. It's more like it's it's connected to something very. Is it simple? I mean, simple doesn't mean simplistic, but it's like the beauty is not in the thing. There's no beauty in things in general. Things are what they are. They're not beautiful or, or ugly. They're just what they are. The beauty is in my eyes. It's in my interpretation. It's in my perception of things. So this is what I'm exploring, the way I look at things. With salt, Salt can be beautiful for, for a salt artisan, for somebody who harvests harvest salt. It can be boring for someone who's just using salt. It depends on how you look at it. Which lens are you using in, in this case? It's, it's not even metaphorically. It's like, really, which lens I'm, I'm going to use to film that salt? <laughs> which lens are you, are you looking at, at it through? So uh, what do I want to say with it? What did I learn about this? Is there... There is something fascinating. I mean, with salt, it's very easy for me to be fascinated because once I put it under the lens of a microscope, I was just like, shut up. Yeah. This is impossible. Yeah. Salt crystallizes in a square pattern. It makes beautiful, almost like Egyptian, not Egyptian because they would be pyramid, py pyramids, <laughs> but like... It, it, ancient it, it, patterns. It, ancient patterns. Yeah. It's like biblical almost. It's like pure square. Wow. You've got a cube and you're looking at it through the lens of a microscope. And you, how can that be? Is that nature? I thought nature was round and curly and no, it's just pure square. It's like a monolith. Wow. Monolith. It's like a um, um, 20, 20, you know, um, 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Like the monolith. It's like exactly the same. It's like crazy. And then I took a, a bit of fleur de sel. So the first one was just a piece of salt. The second one was like high-end salt. Place it in, under the lens of a microscope. Look, look at it. And then this one is a hollow pyramid. And that's why it's crunchy, but it's very light. And I'm thinking, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I need to share this with the world. Yeah. So is it the, is it the, is it the joy the joy, yes. Of uncovering something yes. that is overlooked. Yes. Because you would amazing. never think to do that. It's amazing. When, when you crack the code, when you understand something that was completely unknown, when you unveil something, it brings so much joy, so much satisfaction. That I just crave for more afterwards. Yeah. I just want to see what the next thing is. And it could be a technique as well. In this case, it's like an ingredient. It's like a, something small that you have to look closer Sometimes it's something that you have to look faster or slower to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. with like, and, and the beauty is that with the tools that we use, the cameras, the slow motions, the lenses, we got plenty of ways to look at things differently. Wider, closer, faster, or like from, from a distance, wider, yeah. There's a quote that I cannot seem to find again that I heard somewhere from an author who explained that to tell the best stories, mm. 
-hmm. You don't have to go on the most insane adventures mm -hmm. or crazy experiences on the other side of the world. You know, telling the best stories comes from your unique particular way of paying attention to things. Man, if somebody watching this or listening to this knows what quote I'm referring to, please send it because I'm trying to find it. I don't want to I don't want to be stealing this person's idea. Mm. But isn't that it's exactly that. And I think that's it's exactly the, that. you can, you can make a good story. It's 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 often a little harder though with something very simple or something very close to you, like a mug that you've got in your closet. You can make a good story with it. It depends. Are you willing to share enough? Are you willing to explore what's happening? Is there, there needs to be some sort of a story behind it, but you, you don't have to go to like the other end of the world. I, I agree with this. You can, and often it's easier to write a story with something a little more unusual, where mm -hmm. something a little more unusual happens, something out of the ordinary, but it doesn't make for the best videos. One of my favorite videos on the channel, I've got a few ones, not because of the way I looked or my, my hairstyle in that video, but more like about like the, the way I treated a subject. And it's one about mayo. Mayonnaise? Mayonnaise. Okay. And mayonnaise is so boring, so normal. So there's nothing to say about mayonnaise. Everything has been said. And the whole video is just why mayo? Why is mayo mayo? Why does this? This is like a mayo is in, in a nutshell, mayo is liquids behaving as a solid. And it's just my and it took me a whole video. It, it takes the, the story a whole video to understand this. And it's just me at first. I, I make mayo in, in, in the episode, in, in like a whisking bowl. And then I've got a pile of mayo, and then I stick a knife in the center. And the knife doesn't move. And I just added oil and egg yolk and a bit of mustard. And I'm thinking, these are only liquids. Yeah. What's happening? Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Yeah. And then this is exactly what you said. The craziness, the beauty of all this, is not in the mayo, it's in my eyes. It's just me being fascinated by something that's happening. And I'm just, I have to reiterate, I have to specify what's happening to the audience. Because I'm thinking, no, 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 you guys are not clipping. I mean, you guys are not seeing what I'm seeing. We've only used liquid ingredients. Look at this. This is solid as can be. A knife is standing up proudly in, in there. How come? And then the whole video goes exploring why and the science and all this. But uh, it... But the ingredients, you can get mayo everywhere. It's probably my fridge right now. So there's nothing exceptional with the ingredients that yeah. I use. It's just eggs and oil. So yeah, it, it just goes to show that the quote you, you are trying to remember is, is, is so accurate. But why, why is that one of your favorite videos? Is it just that particular moment where you're... It's, it's one of my favorite videos in, in how properly the construction can be made sometimes. It's very constructed. It's very clean. Where we come from, where we end up with. Mm -hmm. It starts somewhere with a setup. It establishes a context, a situation, explains the intricacies of the problem that we're facing. And then slowly it moves towards the resolution of the problem, the solving. And then at the end, we end, up, we end back where we started. Mm -hmm. So in terms of construction, it's a good example for me. At the same time, uh, it's lacking a bit of... Uh, it's not lacking anything in that video. But I've got other videos I like, which are less well constructed in terms of narrative, but just more spontaneous. And about the encounter, or like the person I've met, and the laughs we had, and people can feel that as well. The first one, oh wow, really understanding. If, if I watch this and I'm interested in mayo and I'm willing to open my world to it or to give it some attention, I'm going to go, oh, I'm going to get some satisfaction from <clears throat> cracking the code of mayo. But I might not feel something like joy or like, um, I don't know, the feelings you can feel when you see two people clicking together on have, having a good moment. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, watch these two guys having a conversation with a cup of tea and thinking, wow, that's a good moment. I'm having a good moment. No, it's just like I understood something and there is joy in this, like when you're understanding a math problem or something. But uh, 
so that's why I like this video. But I also love when some videos are more about something you you can less touch. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so interesting because that first example that you gave made me think that storytelling is so much about simply just moving the audience. You try to, I, what I try to do is I leave people in a different place than where they started. Brilliant. But what's so fascinating about your second example is that the ways you can do that are various, right? And mm. and there's something incredibly difficult to pin down, but very real mm. about spontaneous moments with people. Mm. They can still change you. They can still put you in a different place than where you yes. started, but yes. it's like you can't quantify that necessarily. It's no. just these things that cannot be orchestrated. Mm. They cannot be... I mean, you can create Magic. the right conditions. Yeah, yeah. You can come with the right yes. energy. Yes. You can come with the curiosity, but you can't script it. No. You know, and it, then it just happens, and then you have that, and you 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 tell a story with that. Maybe people can feel that. Maybe that's why it's so magical. Yeah. Maybe that's why these moments are like precious and rare. Maybe as well, yeah. because it, it, I think it's it's, it's very it's very accurate to to think that we're we're trying to put all things in the right mood. We are trying to bring the right conditions, but then we just wait. And we were being open to this. It's a, it's almost like something we discussed a little earlier on when when we said uh, to achieve a goal, you can. You, yeah, there are many ways to achieve a goal: mm -hmm. striving, grinding, but also sometimes just resting or accepting or being cool, being chill, meeting folks. Maybe it's going to bring you forward as well. And in this case, both of these videos, like the one that is heavily scripted or the one that is more spontaneous, they they bring like the the audience in a different state, which is. I, I agree 100% with you on this. Like one of the goals of my videos, to, to make them change, to, mm -hmm. to, to make them move forward, to, 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 to touch them in some ways, mm. to touch like their, their, not their soul, but like, a, to, yeah, to, to, to change something somewhere. And the second one with like spontaneousness, spontaneity or whatever the noun is. Spontaneity, yeah. <laughs> spontaneity, uh, just trying to, touch people's feeling and just have them smile behind their screen. Because I know this, I've seen it sometimes. And this is usually a very good sign when I'm watching one of my videos that I haven't seen in a while. And I'm looking at this guy that I interviewed and I'm genuinely smiling. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, that's such a fun moment. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm always, weirdly enough, even though, for example, I don't read the comments that much mm. i read the top comments in my videos i do exchange messages sometimes with the audience as much as i possibly can because it's, it's also pretty demanding to do this so yeah. I, I i'll do it with caution but in the end i still try to please them i still try maybe not ple maybe pleasing is not the right word it's more i still i want them to have a good time yeah i want them to to have a great time yeah. when they watch the video i want i want this to be a party I want this, whatever, whatever form it is, it could be scripted, not scripted, but I just want them to end the video and thinking, ah, sure, that was a moment. Yeah. You give them an experience. I mean, it's actually and very it's like, similar to cooking for someone, right? You're exactly, you're, you're, you're being a chef just in the form of a audio visual experience. I think so. Wow. Well, I feel like that's a really great spot actually to, to end things. Because uh, I feel like I want to be cognizant of your time because yes. you've got to go, right? Um, but thank you so much My for, pleasure, for man. coming and joining. And maybe maybe you could be a returning guest sometime in the future if you're down because I would love... This is one of my favorite topics ever. Just food and the philosophy and the life implications of mm. all of it. It's just something that um, ranks very highly up there in my life in terms of things that genuinely just bring me joy. Um and uh, and so just to be able to discuss with you how you see it and the processes and whatnot, it's so fascinating. So thank you. Thank you so much, man. That was a conversation with Alex. I'll leave links to his work in the show notes or description. For those of you that have been watching this podcast on YouTube, this is just a friendly reminder that it's actually available anywhere you can listen to podcasts. And one way you can help me out if you have been enjoying this podcast is by leaving a positive review or sharing it with a friend. And having said that, Thank you for listening.